Hola, buenas. So it's great to be here. You know, Spain is my favorite country for speaking. Not just because of the food, you know, because of the people. So it's really great, you know, I, uh, I've been doing this for 15 years, speaking about the future. And it's very important to realize that my work is not about predicting the future. Right? It's about observation. So I spent my time looking at the next five to seven years at all the key trends. And the last few years, uh, all my speeches I, I speak at, people ask me, what is going to happen to humans when everything is technology? Uh, this is an important question. Because when we talk about education, we're first talking about humans. We don't have to educate machines. So I wrote this book, Technology versus Humanity, uh, two years ago, and it's now available in Spanish to answer the question, or to try to answer the question about what will happen to people. Uh, I have a couple of free books here if you want to come up later. We can talk about it. So this is the topic of today. Right? Humans and machines are converging in a way. It's a strange thought, you know, when we use this, uh, when we use this machine here, that's our external brain, is your second brain. And if you have kids, teenagers, is your first brain. Right? Uh, but you know, this machine has a million times the power of the machine that brought, uh, you know, the same power, sorry, that brought the Americans to the moon. This box here. Huh? In 10 years, this machine will have a million times the power. So I can do a DNA test of my genome in 10 seconds on my mobile phone. I mean, imagine we're going to be superhuman, right? And who does not want to be superhuman? That's a strange question, right? That, that is a key question when we talk about education, but also about the future, because really, the bottom line is this, you know, we are moving into a world where the next team member will be a robot. And we're going to go into a world where everything that's routine, you know, that's monkey work, yeah? trabajo de whatever, right, will be done by an intelligent machine, a robot, artificial intelligence. If you're a bookkeeper, half of your work will be the machine. If you're a financial advisor, you can talk to a machine and get help. If you're a doctor, you can speak to the machine and get oncology support. Any doctors in the room? Any doctors? Yeah. If you're a doctor, you know there's 3,500 new oncology reports a week on cancer. How is the doctor going to read 3,500? It's impossible, right? The machine reads the report. That's not a bad thing, but of course we could worry about this, you know? Where is this going? Because, you know, the future is becoming science fact. Right? Science fiction is becoming science fact. Remember, we talked about 20 years ago about the paperless office. Right? We talked 20 years ago about the solar energy change. Yeah? If you invested in solar energy 20 years ago, you lose your money. Yeah? Today we have this, you know, we have self-driving cars and actually, where you can actually sit in the back uh, in Palo Alto, California, not the front like a Tesla. <laughs> and I mean, of course, this would not work in Madrid, right? Uh, this works in Palo Alto, <laughs> uh, California. And then when we have robots that can do what humans can't even do. Uh, this is a robot. From, uh, from Boston Dynamics, it's 850 kilo robot. Right? And five years ago, that robot could not even open a door without breaking down the house. Right? And now this robot, check it out. Right? Look at this. Right? I mean, that's also very scary, right? You do not want to meet that robot in the battlefield. Yeah. You don't have much of a chance. Okay, the next thing is going to be, hey, Google, I have to get married. Find somebody for me. <laughs> That's like a Tinder Google, Tinder Rugle. Right? I mean, we're going to be talking to our cars like we talk to people. We're going to be talking to our television. The television talks to us. I mean, there's the first people suggesting that we can have a relationship with a robot, you know? 
Would be very convenient, I suppose. And here in Japan, they have funerals for robots. Yeah? These are robot pieces, you know, from a, a robot called a Aikibo. And lots of people have this in Japan. And when, and when the robot gets broken, they make a funeral, you know, with a. And this is a robot called Sophia that you may have heard about. And this is the inter most interesting story about this robot is that people think Sophia actually is, you know, really talking, but the whole thing is completely scripted, right? It's a typical example for we think that me these machines are starting to be like humans far away, right? I'll tell you about why that's important in a second, but, you know, so it's no wonder that people are worried, right? Uh, people are worried that robots will take over everything. And we're a long time away from this. Uh, five weeks, no, just kidding. Uh, I'll tell you about why that is, but, you know, we're at the takeoff point of exponential change, you know, how technology is changing so fast. I mean, the curve, you, you know about Moore's Law, Every 18 months, technology goes twice the power, half the price. But now this is the important part, right? We're at the takeoff point. See my fancy new pointer here? So here we're here now. We're at the point to where it's actually important. When I first started doing things on the internet, we were here, right? I mean, there was nothing happening here. I tried to do something like Spotify when I was a musician in 2001. It, was, it didn't matter. But now we're at the point where really science fiction is becoming science fact. Computers can listen, they can hear, they can talk, they can see, they can learn. Can they love? No. Can they really do what we're doing every day? Not yet. 50 years? Maybe. But we're at the point where all, I mean, look at these things that are happening, right? I mean, it's just, Boom, right? The Internet of Things, smart everything, augmented reality, quantum computing. Very exciting. On one hand, yeah. I always say it's 90% good and 10% frightening. Right. What we don't want to see happen that these things become, have so many consequences, you know, social, cultural, political consequences, that they become 50% bad. Right? We have to keep a good eye on this. And who is going to help us that it doesn't become bad? Do you think the companies that are inventing this are going to help us to restrict it? That's very unlikely, right? I mean, Facebook, right? I mean, Facebook was magic and really great once, and today it's a panopticon, right? It's a surveillance machine. It's the biggest AI in the world. So, when we talk about the future, there's five or six game changers that we have to keep in mind, and this is really a big deal for education. Everything is becoming data. Everything is becoming cloud, healthcare, car, logistics, the Internet of Things. Everything is becoming smart. Right? Machines can actually do cognitive work. Everything is becoming computing with quantum computing you know, 3D computing, which is being invented right now. So we're, we're thinking roughly in five years, a computer will have the capacity a million times of this box. Unlimited. So here's something we have to get used to in our world, right? We're basically moving towards a world, also based on blockchain, of course, where everything becomes technology can do anything. It becomes limitless. Roughly 10 years, unlimited computing, Unlimited mobile networks, unlimited sensors, unlimited cloud, unlimited battery, more or less, right? and unlimited energy in 20 years, solar energy. The only thing that's not unlimited, guess who that is? Right? Us. We're still just the same. <laughs> We're going to get older, yes. We'll get more powerful. But we can't, this is not us, right? Uh, in fact, you could say humans have very little to do with all of this. I mean, humans don't care about data. Right? We're not computers. Well, I, I don't think we are computers. There are some people saying that we are computers. But we're going to change more in the next 20 years than the previous 300 years. 
Industrial Revolution, the Internet, the atomic bomb, the television, the telephone, steam engine. But now technology is actually changing us. Right? When I use the mobile phone and augmented reality, I, I think differently. Right? And this is the biggest problem, for example, in social media. It makes me think differently. It's going inside my head. And now technology is actually going inside my blood. You know, nanobots in the bloodstream, genetic engineering. So when technology is on the outside, fine. But when technology is on the inside, it's a whole different thing. And if you're an educator or a teacher, you have to think about that. Because you know what that means is that machines can do your thinking. That's a good thing and a bad thing. Right? Right, think about that for a second. Right? And we have to be very careful, you know, because we don't want to live in this kind of world. Right? I call this machine thinking, right? where everything is an algorithm, every rule is written, right? everything is out in the open, there's no privacy, there's complete surveillance. There's the first insurance companies who monitor your car, and then you pay as much as you drive, or how you drive. Right? I mean, think about that for a second. Because you know what would result, for example, if health insurance was actually proportional to who you are, that's the end of solidarity. Right? It's a very bad idea. Because you know what it means? You never drive fast, you never speak loud, you never smoke, you never drink, you never move, you never fall in love, you never make a mistake. That's inhuman. Right? So that's not a good idea. And in fact, you know, in education, you can safely say, we have to stop teaching our children to uh, basically just download information, to fill up the hard drive, right? and to produce best practices. I mean, I went to music school, so actually in, in my music school, Berkeley College, it was a lot like this. You fill up the hard drive with all intellectual information about music. You know? In many ways, I would say I was probably a better musician before I went to college. That's just my particular case. <laughs> Do you want children that have all the information downloaded, but it's only like 0.01% of the available knowledge? Or do you want children that can go and get knowledge instantly? Because it's there. In five years, we're going to sit down and talk to IBM Watson and say, please show me the future of Spain, a GDP versus GNP versus projected income versus, and it will just boom tell you. That used to take you about a week to figure out. Right? And before the internet, a month. Why do we need students that have all downloaded all this useless information, data? Right? We're moving up in a world that goes from data and information to knowledge, which mach some machines have knowledge. Right? But what's really important for us is understanding. Right? What humans have is understanding. I'm going to tell you the difference. When you sit down in the evening and your kids come home from school, the kids can tell you information. The grades, the meetings, they miss the bus, whatever. That's called information. Okay? But when you look at your 12-year-old son and you realize your son has, for the first time, fallen in love, you can tell. Right? That's called understanding. Right? And machines will never have that. Because to have understanding means you can read things that are not there, or between the lines, things that are not said. We should not make every information explicit. Your son isn't going to come home and say, I have fallen in love. Do you understand? Right? No. So this is really important for us when we think about education, because smart machines are a reality. Right? And mind you, when I talk about smart machines, I don't talk about intelligence. That's a stupid word. Right? Artificial intelligence? It's neither artificial nor is it intelligent. Right? The Google self-driving car and the computer behind it can drive the car pretty well. But if I take it outside the car, it's as dumb as a toaster. Right? It doesn't know how to play chess. It can't talk to my grandmother. They can't even change money for me. Right? It, it can just drive the car. 
It's far away from humans. So what we have now clearly is a huge shift in technology. And we're going into the world that used to be programmed by many of us who are programmers. Right? And this is why we say our children should know how to program, right? Who gives a damn? In a world like this, do we need people to program computers? Yeah, some. But, but not like this. You know. In this world, every programmer is like God, you know, because they can do something. Here, machines understand stuff. They look at a trillion pieces of data, and then they say, we're going to change the traffic pattern in Madrid and save 10% energy. Because when they have the data and they have the computing, they can do it. I mean, there is no compassion required. Right? This is just data. When the doctor has a computer, they can read oncology of the scans of the skin right? from a melanoma. The computer has read 500 million images of melanoma. Do you think the doctor will have a better understanding of the first diagnostic? The second and the third, yes. Because it's different. But you know, looking at an image and saying it's possibly bad or good, computers can do that. Right? But you know, when the computer sees it's melanoma, he will not just spit out a word and say, hey, you have cancer. Right? That would be stupid. Right? It takes a little bit more than that. Right? So in this world, you know, basically, the CEO of DeepMind says, Demis Hassabis, artificial intelligence are computers that turn information and data into knowledge. Right? Now, if you're into education, this will scare you. I mean, aren't, aren't we supposed to have knowledge? Aren't we supposed to teach our kids or whoever is in college or training to have more knowledge? If the machines have knowledge, what do we do? I mean, it's a key question. And right now, today, machines don't really have knowledge. You know, that's a little bit early. Five years, seven years, ten years, machines will have every possible knowledge you could ever imagine instantly on demand to my wristwatch. I mean, now you can sit at the bar and you can say, what's the capital of Kazakhstan? And you can, you know. But in the future, you can say, hey, I have these three or four symptoms, you know, I don't feel well, and the computer will instantly do a remote diagnostic of all of your important stuff, because it knows everything about you. That's called knowledge. If computers have knowledge, what do we have? If we pride ourselves too much on knowledge, you know, we're missing the whole point. Right? Humans have understanding. They have foresight. They can look ahead. Right? They have what's called wisdom, some of us. Right? They have emotional intelligence, feelings. 95% of what we have, computers will probably never have. Maybe in 50 years? So I hope not. But I'll get more into detail on this later. But the bottom line is we should not allow computers to change themselves. I mean, imagine if you have a computer in five years that has an IQ of 100,000, right? which is possible. An IQ in the sense of computing. Right? We would not want those guys to hang out together. Uh, and that's what Elon Musk has been talking about. So, the other thing that's happening here is called machine learning. That's a part of artificial intelligence. And it's basically when the computer gets all the data, right, it's a science that allows them to basically program themselves. And that is the big deal today. It's not the machine itself, it's the learning. And again, if you're in education, you're saying, OK, learning? Right? That, that's human. Now, these machines are not learning like humans. You know how a machine learns? Zero, zero, one, 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 zero, 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 one, one. Yes, no, yes, no. If this, then that. Do humans learn like this? No. How do we learn? 0 0.137, 1.436, and if this, then maybe that, or maybe this, or maybe we just lie. Right? We make mistakes. So a bit more complex than that, right? So machines are very good learners, but they're not learning like we do. Right? This is Google DeepMind, 
playing against the world champion in Go. Go is a uh, Chinese-Korean game, the most complicated game in the world. 3.5 trillion possible moves. People like to say more possible moves than stars in the universe. It's not mathematical. It's a strategy game. And it was said that a machine would take 15 years to beat the world champion. It took 14 months for Google. And this machine beat this guy, Lee Sedol. In move 37, the machine made a move that no human would ever do because it means you die in the game. But the computer played millions of games online and simulated itself and he found a move that was completely unlikely, and he won every game afterwards. And now the computer can play poker, which, which is not really, I mean, it's, it's bluffing, right? How can a computer play poker? These machines are not programmed, they're trained. And that is a huge difference. I think it's really 90% positive, because if we can train them to do the monkey work, the number work, it does mean that we're going to change what we are doing, but why not? As long as they don't do our work, you know, the important work. So I made this map based on uh, uh, Moravec and also Mark Max Techmark to show you what artificial intelligence can already do. It's called the landscape of human competence. And so what happens is, over the, since 1997, artificial intelligence is the rising tide. Right? So mapping, assistance, advertising, the call center, language translation, poker, Go, speech recognition, one victory after the other. <laughs> now, here's the interesting part. The stuff on the top, human resources, making movies, politics, invention, fiction writing, will computers ever do that? I would say maybe some politicians are already artificial intelligence. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you which one, you can take your guess. Eh? Badly programmed, of course. So here's the interesting part. I think really what's happening here is that we have to consider this and say, OK, here this is really called IA, right? Intelligent Assistance. It's software, fancy software. And if you're in business and also in education, this is a no-brainer. Right? It is dangerous for jobs, not for existence. And then we have AI, which is you know, more general, but still kind of tangible. And on the top, we have AGI, Artificial General Intelligence. That is something we do not want. I mean, a machine that's generally intelligent, you know what it would do, right? I mean, by definition, it would say, first, I'm going to figure out how you can never take my plug out. I connect with all the other guys. Right? And then it would basically do whatever it's programmed to do or whatever it would decide it could do. So here the bottom line is narrow AI is fine, but disruptive. But this, we need a moratorium on general intelligence, you know, on this top level, as Elon Musk has said. So bottom line on these two things is data is the new oil and AI is the new electricity. And all of the progress in business is based on those two things. This is what runs the world. Right? McKinsey says $15 trillion new revenue shift and destruction of old revenues. And guess who's doing this? I mean, if we're looking at the numbers, eh? the forecast from McKinsey and Atlas eh? Who are the leaders in this market? China, US, maybe India, not Spain. $14 trillion. This is a gold rush. I always jokingly like to say, selling out humanity is the biggest business we have ever seen. There's a lot of things that are good about this, but think about this for a second, where this takes us. Who governs the world? Who defines? the future. And this is the sad part today. You know who talks about the future? Not the politicians, right? not society, IBM. Right? IBM is one of my clients, they're a pretty smart company, but we should not let the conversation about the future be determined by the tech companies. 
I mean, this is the companies that run the world, right? I'm not saying this badly. Many of them are my clients. We have to think about this for a second. The top four companies on this list, they have more money than the GDP of France. They could buy France. I think they would think about that for a second. But I, Crazy. And they have tripled in revenues in four years. These are the most powerful companies in the world, and they're totally, utterly unrestricted and without any attention to what they actually create. Right? Facebook is the biggest country in the world, 2.5 million citizens, and Zuckerberg has more power than any president, really. So we're going to see a lot of regulation here. Because this is one of the key questions I have for you when we think about the future. Who will be mission control? And I'm saying this in a positive way, because to really make a balance, we need to have a balance between what we are and what technology is, unless you wish to become technology. And this is where the problem is, because in Europe, we're humanists. We like humans. And we're also collective. We pay taxes, some of us. In America, capitalists, right? It's not, I'm not saying this badly. It's, you know, we, we can be humanist and capitalist. But in America, it's a different thing. And in China, right? Same thing, but the state is the capital. Right? And so we have this huge problem right now. Who is mission control for humanity? You know that, right? Silicon Valley. They control what we use, where we use it, how we use it, what the laws are, what we can, what we cannot do and how we're going to live in the future. I think it's fine because they're really great companies, but it's time for a compromise. When you think about education, we've got to think in this direction of what are called digital ethics. The ethics of technology. Because today, you know, we laugh about this, you know, we're addicted to the mobile phone. Right? We're addicted to Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. We laugh about this, but you know, the reality is we're only on a scale of 100. We're at three. Virtuality, augmented reality, robots, intelligent machines. You've seen the movie Her, right? The movie where you fall in love with your computer. Great movie to see. Right? I mean, we've got to think about this. Ethics is the difference between what you have a right to do and what is the right thing to do. And here's the, here's the interesting part. In the very near future, you will have the power as a tech company to do anything. Anything. I'm not joking. You have 45 companies in Silicon Valley that talk about the end of dying. This is not a joke. Right? That we may not have to die. You know, it will cost a million dollars, but you know. the rich will never have to die. Genentech, you know, a company funded by Roche, right? they're working on a genome therapy that lives you, gets you to live until 150 years old. I mean, think about this for a second. What is the retirement age in Spain? I think 63 for women or so. Right? You get to live to be 150, so you have 90 years on the cruise ship. Yeah? 90 years. Oh, Mind-boggling. So, best example for the lack of ethics, our friends from Facebook. Right? Shooting at democracy with social media. Right? Mark Zuckerberg is not a bad guy, he's a nice guy. Right? He wants to do the right thing. Facebook was not hacked. Facebook is not criminal. The scary part is that Facebook worked exactly as designed. Designed to manipulate. Which is fine, but you know, politics? Democracy? Trump? I mean, it's without a reasonable doubt, it's 99.9% .9 certain that we would not have Trump as a president without this. Right? Now you can say, well, I don't want, you know, like Trump or not, you know, different question. But I think if you like Facebook, you have an ethical obligation right, to do the right thing. I mean, talking about, you know, how that impacts all of our lives, this is the bottom line. Technology does not have ethics. Right? It doesn't give a damn. 
and it shouldn't. Technology is computing. It's a tool. The hammer doesn't say to the carpenter, I wish you would make a yellow house. Right? It doesn't care what house you make. It's a hammer. Right? Technology doesn't care whether you're in love or whether you want to save the world or, or kill everyone. It's just technology. Eh? Technology is morally neutral until we use it. And now is, of course, interesting. We use it everywhere now. Okay. So we have to think about this. When technology is not so important and it hardly works, it doesn't matter. But in the future, technology will be everywhere, in medical care, logistics, environment, energy, banking. Right? So this is what we have to teach our kids. Some people say we have to teach our kids to be a good character. It's a great German word called Mensch, which is widely used around the world, how to be a Mensch, you know, a human. This is what we have to teach our kids. Why should our kids have to learn what technology can do for them within reason? For example, languages, right? We should know languages, even if the machine can do the language. Right? So a very important question, what will it mean to, mean to be human if technology makes us infinitely powerful? And it will. The question is not if, it's just the question when. When are we going to get to the point to where we can have a brain-computer interface allows us to connect to the internet? Wouldn't you like this? Think about this for a second. Wouldn't, I mean, who would not want to be superhuman? It's like uh, mental Viagra, you know? Superpower. Never get tired. And if you had this, I would have to have it, because otherwise I'm a lame dog, you know? I, I can't compete with these people. So once we do this, where does it go? Right? Talk about education of the future. Is that the education of the future? Download, you know? I mean, you've seen that in Minority Report and others, of course, right? But it's, it's actually going to become feasible. So, we can become like God, touch the gods, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, very tempting. As I said earlier, the biggest business in the world is to sell us to be like God. I'm not religious, I don't know what you think about God, I don't care, but is that a good idea? I mean, think about this for a second, where this will, will take us in the, in the end, you know, which way we're going. Uh, as some people are saying, we can finally transcend our human limitations. That's what technology is promising, is promising us. If we teach our kids that we have to transcend human limitations, right, I'm all fine with that, you know, cleverer, smarter, faster, good. Right? But really what we have to be is more human. Clever or faster? Forget that. Computers will beat us. Ten years, game over. Here's the key question. Why? We need more why-sayers. There was actually an ad from IKEA five years ago in, in Sweden. There was a whole-page ad in the newspaper said, we're looking to hire why-sayers. Right? Asking questions. You know, the most common skill that human resource people are asking for these days Emotional intelligence, critical thinking. That's the future. In other words, to be human. And where do we learn that? Do we learn that in school? I mean, I live in Switzerland. You know, much of what we learn in school is not to say why, but to say, yes, yes, I'll do it. Or what, what's the process? How can I copy somebody else's process? You know, it's funny, in America, 17% of people who graduate from college start their own company. In Switzerland, 2%. Because we're not wise-sayers. Right? We're, we're saying, yeah, 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 okay. Continue. I mean, research says in the next uh, 10, 15 years, 60% of jobs in Spain will be taken away by automation. 60%. And 
And then there's other research saying in 10 years, 70% of all new jobs have not even been invented. Huh? Our kids are going to have to invent their own job, make their own rules, write their own laws, figure out their own money. Right? 50% of people will be working in the gig economy. 50%. So we better make sure that actually works. Eh? As I like to say, societies are driven by technology, but defined by humanity. The worst possible case that we can have is a super intelligent human or a machine that has no other constrictions. Super intelligent people are just as bad as super intelligent machines when there is no frame, right? So in my book, I'm proposing to start a digital ethics council, globally. A council that does not think about how we're going to make more money with technology, how we're going to sell more stuff, you know, how we're going to build better mousetraps, uh, that thinks about how we're going to be human in the future when everything is automated. Where do we put our money? I mean, think about this for a second. We put trillions of dollars, literally trillions of dollars, into artificial intelligence, building machines that can think. How much money do we put into human intelligence? No, the opposite. We cut music, we cut sports, we cut ethics, we cut philosophy, and we teach people how to program. It's great if you can program, but is that the future? So what is the future of education? A couple of thoughts on this. First, we're living in this world. As of today, we're at the pivot point. Yeah, we're at the takeoff point here, right? Where it starts to divert. Consider yourself lucky because you know, this is where every, all the action is. And the bottom line is really this. Uh, technology is exponential, but we are not. Huh? You can try as hard as you want. You're not going to be exponential unless you become a machine. You can take neotropics or nootropics, you can do all kinds of chemical things, you can try to reduce the sleep. You're not going to beat the machine. I cannot put more CPU in my head. So here's what it comes down to. Machine smartness becomes a total commodity. I mean, IBM is putting supercomputing in the cloud. I can ask any question. I mean, I, can, I don't need futurists. I can say, what is the future of Spain? What is the f future of whatever? And, and I'll, I'll hear all the answers from IBM Watson. Right. It's humanness that makes a difference for us. Right. And I'm not saying that we should not have a lot of technology. I'm saying the opposite, right? Clearly, we need both. Right? But here's my biggest fear. My biggest fear is not that machines will take over or kill us. That is a fear I would have in 50 years, if I get to live that long. You know, trying to take lots of supplements for this. But my biggest fear is that we, we become too much like a machine. That everything is measured with efficiency, algorithms, you know, power, speed, money, and we just respond and say, yeah, you know, I don't date, I use Tinder. I don't learn an instrument, I download the iPad app. I don't bother reading anything because I can watch a video. I mean, it's just a list of thousands of things. Some things that we do as human are a process. I mean, to learn an instrument, I, I'm a guitar player, it takes 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. If you're really good and fast, maybe it will take 2,000 hours, but not two hours. It's a process. It's not a machine. And this is what it comes down to in our world. You know, we really have to think when we talk about education, let's not worry all the time about IQ. That's like worrying about GDP. Right? We're going to worry about gross national product, profit, growth. I mean, pff, you know what actually matters, right? Growth national happiness index, national progress indicator. I mean, whole different story, you know, thinking about those things. On one side, we have STEM, science, technology, engineering. And, and we think this is our saving grace. Right? We're all going to be great scientists. And science is amazing. I mean, I, I wish I could be more of a scientist. You know, I'm not. 
But here's what we need. I'll write in my book, I'll write about this. I call this hickey, like STEM, you know. Humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. If there's one thing you want your kids to have, it's imagination, passion, understanding, you know, all the things that machines will never have because they don't exist. That's the key to our future. If you have the choice, great. Let's have our kids be scientists and have hacky, right? Yeah. It will not be so easy because it's, uh, you know, we have to invest one place or the other. The next five years, if you're a programmer, you will have a guaranteed job. In 10 years, over. Right? You need to be a data scientist or an AI guy or an interface designer. And first of all, in the future of education, we need to be more human. And not superhuman, right? Just more human. So a few things to remember when we talk about this. First, the smart machines that we talk about, they are totally unlike us. And that's, that's why we should never use the word intelligence when we talk about machines. Let's call it machine smartness. That's a good word. Intelligence, you know what intelligence means? I mean, researchers have looked at this. There's eight or 10 or 12 different pieces of intelligence. Emotional intelligence. Some people say that women have more emotional intelligence generally than men, which leads some other people to say that women are the future. I'm just going to let that stand as a, you know. I think we all agree on that, yeah? And you know, I see lots of women, which is great, so I'm pretty sure on that. But we have social intelligence, uh, kinesthetic of the body. What intelligence does a machine have? Huh? I mean, what intelligence? I mean, it's, it is a computer, right? It computes. It has intellectual intelligence. 0101, but unlimited. Right now, 450 quadrillion calculations per second in the future unlimited. And we cannot compete on that level. We will never beat the computer in logic and calculation. Today, we have a bit of a chance. Five years, finished. Right? That's the one point. The second point is machines don't do relationships. Because you know what a relationship is? When you meet somebody for the first time, it takes the average human 0.4 seconds to estimate the other person. 0.4 seconds. I know whether you're a threat or potential relationship or an idiot or whatever, right? 0.4 seconds is 95% accurate. Computers don't care about the stuff that's not data. Right? I mean, when you marry your husband or your wife, are you going to say, I married my husband or we're getting married because my husband is so efficient? Right? That's what a computer would say. Right? Computer would say, yeah, it's great data. Right? Doesn't matter to us. Right? If my wife is totally inefficient, it's a nuisance, you know? But it's not an argument. <laughs> so, I mean, what matters to human brains, only two things, relationship and experience. Okay? And none of that computers would even understand. The Facebook computer that scans your photos when you upload a photo, is the same software that the FBI is using at the border to identify people and look at your facial muscles. The computer says, I mean, I, I got off Facebook, but the computer says, in theory, Gert is tired, right? And every time I put a photo, it says, Gert is tired again, or whatever, right? But the computer does not know what a face is, right? and he certainly doesn't know what it means to be tired. This is just data. Tired 11101 data. It has no comprehension of any value of that data. Second, this is what we do as humans, right? We don't think with the brain, we think with the body. As many psychologists have said, right? We think with the body, not with the brain. So computing is a bit more complicated than this, right? Uh, and, of course, computers don't have bodies for the time being. Uh, happiness is not an algorithm, it's not a download, it's not an app, and humans aren't code. Okay. And that's what we have to teach our kids. The world is not a machine, other humans are not code, you can't program happiness. Okay. You have to discover it. 
And this is part of the process that I think we have to think about when we talk about education. So, as Ehrlichman said in his book about happiness, very important summary of that is basically what we really are looking for is this. It's called PERMA, right? Positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, accomplishment. That's what creates happiness. And some philosophers have said, you know, technology is really not what we seek, but how we seek. It is a tool to find this. Okay? Technology is not this. It's a tool to get there. And we need to teach our kids that. You know, when you, when you look around, I can see many people have more relationships with their screen than they have with people. You know, the most, the most, uh, the most common, the most busy social network users have the biggest suicide rate in the world. People who are on social networks all the time have the highest suicide rate in the world. It makes lonely. Right? And you know, loneliness is the number one killer in the world. It's not obesity, it's not cancer, it's loneliness. Right? I mean, the stats on this are pretty surrounding when you're looking at all of these things. So, how do we redefine our jobs from this and the, our purpose? Right? You know how often I hear this? Right? We're going to be useless. Right? We're the horses of the digital age, the pets of the robots. Right? And why is that? Because the robots are so smart. Right? And to which I say, well, I think that's true for some jobs. We'd be useless, like driving, maybe, flying an airplane, maybe, right? bookkeeping. But you can see in the airplane already, right? We're basically useless in the airplane because the airplane can fly itself already. Why do we have a pilot? Because there's many other uses for the pilot. Right? This is not about computing. This is about many other things. And we still have a pilot. Would you go on an airplane without a pilot? Yeah, you, know, you could say maybe Americans would. No, just kidding. But if it was 90% cheaper, maybe you would. Right? So as far as jobs is concerned, it is one certainty the end of routine is coming. Everything that is routine, machines will learn, as long as it's just monkey work. Yeah. Filling out a form, getting data, making a non-disclosure agreement, checking a contract, legal discovery, bookkeeping, financial controlling, auditing, basically everything that PricewaterhouseCoopers does. No, just kidding. No. But, you know, all of the stuff that's, you know, little things like this. And it may take five years, seven years, ten years, but it's not going to take 50 years. Yeah. And here's the good thing about this. The end of routine is not the end of our work. It is the end of routine. If your job is 100% routine, checking out at the supermarket, your job is toast. And that is difficult. Because it's still a job. We have to work on that. But for us, you know, when 50% is routine, so what? We can find other things to do, better things to do. If the doctor has a 60% routine writing out prescriptions, the computer can do it great. The doctor has more time to talk. If the doctor doesn't have to go and research stuff all the time and look up the latest cases, maybe the doctor has more time to think. Or he can play golf, you know, whatever. And also, do you know how much work we have that's currently out there that is not paid or voluntary? Right? taking care of kids, taking care of elders, social work, artist work, writing books, government work. Right? We could pay for that. The doctor could do social work because he has time. So here's the important part, you know, because of this routine thing, anything that is not routine, that cannot be digitized or automated, becomes extremely valuable. And that is where education is going. We need to teach our kids to have passion, empathy, imagination. Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. And I, you know, I would be careful with this, because obviously Einstein was a genius. Right? He had a lot of knowledge. <laughs> so I'm fine with knowledge, but really what is important is imagination. Can you think of something else? Can you rethink, unlearn, reskill? Let me wrap up by saying how we're going to do the future. 
We call that doing the future as opposed to talking about it. The future is better than we think. That's my first point. Do not worry so much about machines and AI. And I mean, these things are, we have to think about this, right? But there's so many amazing things that we can do with technology. I mean, so many people are worried about the future. Well, climate change, big problem. Right? And robots will take our work, and then they will kill us. Right? Okay, we can think about that. It's a topic, but you know, it's, the future is a lot better than that. We have reduced poverty. We have increased education worldwide. Right? We are solving the energy problem. Right? I mean, there's so many good things. So let's not look too negatively. We have to reduce the fear. Right? You cannot go into the future based on fear. But on the other hand, whoops, sorry. On the other hand, let's not be stupid. Right? We have to keep the caution. Caution means we are not going to do everything just because it can be done. Right? If we can connect our brain to the internet, I think that is a very bad idea. Even if it can be done, and Elon Musk is uh, proposing it, right? The future, in a nutshell, is this, right? We're going to live in a world that's completely underlined by technology like the cloud and the Internet of Things and intelligent machines, and that is our future. We're not going to go back. But on top of that, we need this, right? We need to put the human in the middle, not the technology. Technology is a tool. Let's not get carried away and fall in love with the tool. We want to fall in love with people. And that's really what education is about, is to understand those things. Right? Humanity on top of technology. And let's make no mistake about this either. You're going to need to understand technology right, to do that. If you don't understand technology, you don't use technology, it's a very likely chance it will not be there to show you humanity. Right? So we need to advocate for a radically different world, a world where all these options are available. And we need to do it now. We have 10 years to figure this out until we get to the point. And then also we're going to a point, of course, where we have to rethink the economic system. We can't live in a world where we do things just because they make money. This has been talked about for 50 years, and we're finally getting there. I call this people, planet, prosperity. And this is also my personal uh, approach to how I live, right? I mean, prosperity is great, but let's mix it up with two more things, right? What's good for the planet, for people? And that's what we have to teach our kids. So I, I come to the end and basically saying, you know, we have the same cards we've always had. Morals, values, ethics, understanding. Right? But technology is adding new cards every single day. Right? We have to invest as much money and resources in, technology, in humanity as we invest in technology. And this is what education is all about. We cannot cut down on the stuff that makes us human just because it costs money. Because if we do that, we're going to end up being a machine. Very bad idea. So bottom line is, this is what defines our future, right? These two poles, good technology, bad technology, and as I say in my book, we have to embrace technology, but not become it. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>